All right, what's happening, everyone? Welcome to this very special edition of VMFC. As you can probably tell from the thumbnail and the title, we have a very special guest here, Mariano Trujillo. He is the analyst and uh, commentator for Fox Deportes, Fox Deportes in Spanish. And uh, he is also a retired soccer player. He played as a fullback. He played as a little bit of everything in in his career. But before we get on to the interview, which uh, I guarantee you guys are going to enjoy, I want to talk about what happened today, two years ago. Two years ago today, uh, the happiest day of my existence, the happiest day of my life, without a doubt. Um, June 17th, 2018, Father's Day, to be exact. Germany and Mexico faced off in the first game of Group F in the 2018 World Cup. Germany, the defending, the reigning and defending world champions were um, looking to repeat their success from 2014. Mexico went into this World Cup with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt. Um, if you guys know me, you guys know that I'm not the biggest Juan Carlos Osorio fan. And I wasn't expecting much from that World Cup. I thought we were going to go three and out. Um, so I was a little, I don't know, no expectations for this, for this game, you can say, but, um, you can also say that I'm just checking my focus. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's part of the job. All right. Um, there wasn't much that I was hoping for. I was just hoping for a decent performance from Mexico and then Irving Lozano, El Chucky, as we call him. Scores a goal that I don't think I have ever screamed louder. I don't think I have ever gone crazier in my entire life. I like to be a level-headed person sometimes, not always. But when he scored that goal, I don't even remember what minute it was. It had to be like in the late 20s, early 30s. When he scored that goal, my brother and I lost our minds. Not only was it us two that lost our minds... The entire nation of Mexico lost their minds. There was a registered earthquake at the time of the goal. Right? There was a registered earthquake at the time that Lozano scored the goal. People were going crazy. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. And from there, the longest 70 minutes of my life came. Because I'm like, oh my God, Mexico is going to beat Germany. Mexico is going to beat the reigning and defending world champions at the time. And it was just suffer, suffering. It was a lot of intensity. And it it was one of those moments that I'm going to tell my kids about whenever they exist. <laughs> I, I don't think I've suffered more in my entire life, if I'm being completely honest. I was actually wearing this jersey as, as I'm speaking, this jersey. This is the one that I was wearing two years ago today. And then the ref blew the whistle. I hugged my brother. I cried like a baby because it felt like Mexico had won the World Cup. It it legit felt like that. It felt like Mexico had won the World Cup. And I like to commemorate that today, two years after the fact. Um, a heavy, heavy betting underdog. Of course, Nick, shout out to you. Um, I wasn't thinking of the bets. I wasn't thinking of any of that. Mexico beat Germany in the World Cup a year after they got absolutely dismantled in the Confederations Cup 4-1 by Germany by the B side of the German national team so we beat the A side in um in the World Cup in Moscow and you can say well this wasn't Germany's best best team this was actually the worst team that they've ever presented to a world cup yeah whatever you think i give a damn you think i care that it was the worst side that germany has presented to a world cup i don't care mexico won they won one nothing and they took three points from the world champs and guess what i don't care if this makes me sound mediocre or anything like that i'm gonna celebrate that till the day i die let's move on to the interview here we go Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, Mariano Trujillo from Fox Deportes is joining VMFC. My man, thank you so much for doing this. How are you today? 
Pretty good, Alex. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, I'm here to talk about soccer and uh, anything else you want me to talk about. But thank you for having me. Of course. Anytime, anytime. Um, of course, we know what's been going on in the world. Uh, it, it's been chaos for the last couple of months. And we've all had to you know, adapt ourselves to this new lifestyle. And you yourself, in particular, every Saturday morning that, that I tune in to watch the games, uh, it's it's... It, it's very different. The vibe is very different because you guys aren't calling the games in a booth. You guys are calling the games remotely from your own home. And in front of, well, the stadiums are completely empty. So how how is that working from home? We talked a little bit about it before we started <laughs> recording, but working from home, especially in, in this, um, how, how is that? How much do you like it? Well, um, I, I like it, to be honest. It, it's completely different. It, it's different uh, being in the studio, being in the stadium, and now being at home. Uh, you know, calling games. Obviously, you have to adjust and adapt. Um, but but it's been fun. Uh, we were talking before a little bit about it, and um, since I was playing, I got used to traveling, being in hotels, away from home, away from my family. And actually, this is the first year since I uh, started my playing career that I was able to celebrate my birthday with my family. So um, it was it was a, a long time away from the family. So I know this is not the best way um, to to get to that point, but uh, you have to make uh, the most out of it, right? I, I like to be positive, and uh, and all this situation uh, that is enforcing us to adjust our, our daily routines and our and our daily lives. Um, uh, I, I've been enjoying it, honestly. You know, and uh, just waking up. We, we call Bundesliga games. The crew calls are 3 a.m. in the morning. Usually I have to wake up 2 to go to the studio, uh, get ready for the show. You know, it's way better just to wake up, you know, uh, kind of get ready in your in your bathroom and then just go next next door to the other room to, to call <laughs> the games uh, in shorts with flip-flops. So that, that's a funny part, but uh, I, I'm enjoying it, honestly. Um, I was joking with my wife and with my co-workers, like, I can do it. I can do it like this. I don't need to go back to the office. I mean, I miss you guys, but we can meet at the beach or somewhere else just to have fun. But uh, the game so far, I can do it from here. <laughs> wow. Uh, 2 a.m., you have to leave your house to to go yes. to the to the studio my goodness that th those that's one of the downsides of living out west right because <laughs> true yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it is it is it, it's kind of far but uh you know there's some preparation that you have to do uh make up uh put the suit on and all that you have to do a little bit of uh preparation re re rehearsal uh so yeah it takes time it takes time i'm i'm uh i'm a guy that like to be prepared before uh the show so basically the 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 day that I have to work, I don't do I don't do much. You know, I just uh, uh, show up and, and just wait for the for the kickoff. So that's why I don't like to be there two or two and a half hours before the kickoff because I, I am already prepared. But uh, it is what it is. It's part of it, and uh, I, I enjoy what I do. But yes, I mean that that's one of the positive sides of being here in the house. That's awesome, man. It, it definitely sounds like you're enjoying your time at home. That's. That's great. Got to make the most out of it. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the games that you have been calling. Uh, of course, uh, if you guys do not know, Fox has the rights for the Bundesliga, and they they um, they broadcast those games. And you guys were one of the first ones to go back to work, right? And there was a lot of uncertainty going into the 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 Bundesliga restart because we didn't really know how these players were going to look physically. We didn't know how they were going to look um, in, in game shape. You better than anyone probably knows that game shape and physical physical shape are two completely different things. So just based on what you've seen so far, what are some of the tendencies that you have picked up on from these teams? Obviously, as you, as you mentioned, they weren't uh, game ready. If we can, if we can use that, uh, that terminology, they were, uh, yes, probably fitness wise, uh, ready to play, but obviously not at their hundred percent. And, and that's normal because being a wave, uh, a way of the field for, for so long, it affects your body. You just need two weeks to start losing strength, uh, quickness and all that. And, and if you add that you cannot kick the ball in the way that you, that you normally do when, when you're training with your team, it, it was normal that the first games were going to be a little bit sloppy uh, with not the perfect timing in terms of challenges and, and all that. So, um, but, but honestly, I was, I was surprised uh, about um, Borussia Dortmund, Bayern Munich, a couple of teams that look very, very sharp, that look really well. Uh, I was expecting a little bit less 
But uh, it's been, I think, four games. It's going to be the fifth game this weekend, and uh, and the level has improved. You can see players getting used to it. Uh, obviously, in your head, which is, I believe, the, the most important part, uh, they're, they feel safe now after a couple of games, and, and they're following the, the guidelines and the procedures. But um, but I think so far, the players being on the field, they feel comfortable uh, you know, doing what they know how to do. And uh, I think the level of the games and the, le- the individual level especially is going up with, with, the, with the games. Interesting. You mentioned uh, Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund. Uh, besides those two teams, the, the two big teams in Germany, what other teams have stood out to you? What, what team have you, have you called or have you been watching? Um, and you say, wow, they're actually playing really, really good. Yeah, Borussia Mönchengladbach as well. Um, um, I like to I like to watch the teams at the bottom of the table because usually, you know, most of the fans they they look at the top of the table, but I'm I'm the other way around. Uh, and I really like about Bundesliga that most of the ga- most of the games where these ga- uh, teams are involved, they're quality games. You know, you can see uh, Fortuna Düsseldorf that is fighting for a playoff spot. Uh, playing in uh, with a with a philosophy that is uh, attractive to fans that that, that play uh, offensive football, and when you are in, in that situation fighting for a player spot or for relegation, usually you your tendency is to play a little bit different. So Fortuna Düsseldorf, I like um, um, Hertha Berlin as well. They have uh, improved a lot from uh, from the previous games. So uh, I, I judge a lot the style of play and what they try to do on the field, not just the final result. You know, the, the result is it's uh, sometimes not up to what you're uh, performing on the field. Sometimes it can be a bad call from the referee, uh, not a good VAR review, something else, right? And then it's really hard to uh, get back and, and try to fight for the game. But what you're trying to do, their strategy, the intensity especially, uh, I like to focus on that and uh, – a part of Bayer Munich, Bayer uh, Borussia Dortmund, Gladbach, uh, Leipzig started a little bit shaky, but now they're back in uh, their their style of playing. I think those bottom uh, teams uh, are are um, playing well as well. Now they caught my eye. Yeah, th- that's really interesting, actually, because y- usually it's only the fans of those teams that pay attention to those teams, and if, <laughs> you know if you don't have to call them or if you don't if there's no interest there, then you really don't have to watch them. But that's th- that's awesome that you get to keep an eye on every single t- or most of the teams in the league. Um, of course, I I failed to mention at the top of of the interview that you not only are working for Fox now, you are a retired soccer player. You 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 played for uh, a long time. You played in in two different nations or th- two or three different nations. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and 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 of course, when uh, when an athlete has to come to an end to his career, most of them really don't know what to do. And mm-hmm. with and I'm pretty sure you know a lot of them that have no idea what they're doing after the retirement for you how was that transition like from player to analyst um was it a smooth transition did you already kind of have that in the back of your of your mind that you were going to go into broadcasting as soon as your soccer career ended or was this just like oh this is pretty cool let me try it out (laughs) no i was blessed i was i was blessed to be honest because uh my final season here in mls was 2011 and i didn't play much uh, physically, I was fit. I was I was ready to play, but mentally, I was tired. You know, I started to uh, transition my focus and my um, emphasis on on the strategies. You know, and, and I was being a player, but at the same time, in my head, I was trying to prepare the game as if I was a coach. So that brought a lot of uh, conflict between the coach, uh, which was uh, Robin Fraser at that time, which he was USA and MLS, and and myself. Right? I mean. Uh, and I was very respectful, you know, but we had some disagreements and uh, mentally I was tired. I wasn't participating much. I didn't agree with the way he managed the situation, um, but I understood uh, how he was uh, uh, analyzing and, and observing that, that same um, situation. So I was respectful. I finished the season and, and in my head, I was like, I want to be a coach. You know, I want to I want to coach right away. Uh, so I finished that, that uh, season and uh, I joined the the U.S. soccer um, license uh, course, I finished it, uh, so I got my license. So after that, in my head, is I want to coach because with the license I got, I, I'm um, 
I'm capable or I'm allowed to coach in MLS. So I was just deciding where to go, what was going to be the next step, but I had clear in my head that I wanted to be a coach. And um, while I was waiting, uh, a coach from Mexico, from Jaguares de Chiapas, uh, Jose Guadalupe Cruz, called mm -hmm. me. He used to be my coach when I was playing for Atlante and uh, invited me to be part of his coaching staff in uh, Jaguares de Chiapas. So that was an, a, a great opportunity for me uh, with no experience at all, uh, just getting that invitation. So I said yes. I asked my wife. Uh, and like I was telling you, you know, we were used to be six months here, one more year, one year here. So moving from California to, to Chiapas wasn't easy, but we, we were used to do, to do that well, when I was playing. So we moved to Chiapas, uh, and it was an amazing experience. Um, and, and I was telling you that I was blessed because in my head I was ready to be a coach, but uh, I, I knew physically I was capable still to play. So after two weeks of preseason, uh, the coach asked me to uh, to join the the training sessions because we were short on players. So I did, and then he said, you know what, I'm thinking that um, uh, you might help us as a player instead of a, a coach. And I was like, no, you know what, I don't want to play anymore. I'm tired. I don't want to deal with uh, player-coach situations. I want, <laughs> I, I'd rather be a, a player, an assistant. Uh, and he said, you know what, let's just try both. Uh, so the only condition that I asked him was, okay, let me ask the players, okay, if they receive me as a, as a player again and they let me be part of their group, then I will say yes. Um, I asked the players, they said yes, because uh, I pretty much knew all of them. I played uh, with them in, in different teams before, so they knew me. We were good friends, so they said yes. But it was a complicated situation, you know, being part of the group, uh, the uh, you know, in the, being in the locker room with the players, and then after that, going to the other locker room to be part of the coaching staff. Uh, it, was an, it was a great experience. It was an, uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, and I was kind of leaving uh, in the line of uh, understanding the player, but at the same time understanding the coach. I needed to be – I don't need it to be in either side. So I was, I was blessed to kind of you know, pick whatever I wanted from both sides. Uh, after a year, that experience uh, was over because uh, they sold the team to Querétaro and uh, we couldn't move with the team. So, that's the happen so, uh, in Mexico quite Fox often. Invited, that, that's normal in Mexico. <laughs> you know? uh, so Fox invited me to be part of the Gold Cup. you know. But what I was doing as an assistant coach in Chiapas was analyzing her, um, your next opponent, you know, their tendencies, how they play, uh, how they build up from the back, weakness, the strengths. Uh, when they invite me to be part of the studio uh, an analyst or analysis group of with Fox of the Gold Cup 2013, I said, well, you know what, I'm, I like it. I like television. I didn't get my degree in communications in Mexico, but I but I was uh, enrolled in, in college for that. Um, uh, so I said, yeah, I'll I'll try it. The the downside, if if I can say that, was uh, that it was going to be in English, and it was my first experience in television and in a language that it wasn't mine. So um, I said, yes, I went and did a screen test and, uh, and they were happy. So they told me, yeah, I mean, we want you to do it. And I started just with the, with the Mexican national team and little by little, they, they invited me to do more and more and more games. We finished that month and the Spanish had, uh, of Fox said, uh, why don't you stay? So I didn't want to stay. It was something uh, that I wanted to do temporary because I wanted to go back, you know, uh, to, to Mexico and, and, and pursue my coaching dreaming. Uh, but they they um, offer me to travel to Champions League games and to watch and enjoy training sessions live or on site. Um, and I said, yes, it's like, okay, let's just uh, put something in my contract that if I receive an offer, then I will be able to leave with no problem. They said, yes. And, uh, and it happened. You know, Rayados del Monterrey uh, hired El Profe Cruz. He called me, invited me to join his coaching staff as well. And, um, and I needed to make a decision. So based on the, what it was better for the family at that point, we made the decision together of um, staying with television. So that's how my TV career started. It was uh, more more something that I wasn't expecting, but it was more um, uh, out of, uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't like to say luck, but I think it was God putting everything together for me to follow the path because what I did with Chiapas helped me enormously to work uh, in television, to do what I do now in television. And now what, I, what I'm doing in television uh, has been um, preparing me as well to understand the game better and eventually, or maybe in the future, to go back to my uh, coaching dream. 
Wow, that is some journey, man. That that, that is so cool. Um, <laughs> I'll I'll tell you this. Uh, every time that I listen to you, when when you're analyzing a game, I can tell right away that you are a coach in essence because <laughs> of, of the stuff that that you say. And it's funny. I have a 14 year old brother. Uh, he plays soccer, and he and you you give a lot of like little tidbits and and pieces of information for defending. And I always, whenever we're watching a game together, I tell him, listen, listen, because <laughs> I'm sure he knows what Thanks. he's talking about, right? So, yeah, I always kind of got the vibe from you that you wanted to be a coach. I just, I wasn't aware that you were a player coach at some point. And, you know, it just ended up not not completely working out. And, of course, the other stuff that you couldn't control, <laughs> you know, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, you mentioned uh, El Profe Cruz a lot, and that was actually one of the questions that, I wanted to ask you, is he the coach that you learned the most from or who was it? Um, and he was, uh, he, he is a great coach, right? Uh, obviously, most of his concepts, he learned it from uh, Ricardo Lavolpe, not just him, Miguel Herrera, uh, Ruben Omar Romano, a lot of coaches in Mexico follow. Mm -hmm. uh, they had changed, you know, they have uh, made a little bit of a, an adjustment to what they perform right now, but uh, in essence, they follow what Ricardo Lavolpe used to do when he was coaching. Uh, and I will say Ricardo Lavolpe and, and Tuca Ferretti, those are the two coaches. <laughs> and there's another one, um, He was very pragmatic, but in terms of uh, mentality, uh, Hugo Sanchez, uh, to me, is the number one. I was able to be uh, his player, and uh, he changed my mind completely in terms of uh, the things that I uh, I was able to achieve. And I, I wish I could have had him before when I was uh, younger to, to change my, pers my perspective of, of the game. Uh, but in terms of tactics, uh, structure, uh, and all that, I will say Tuca, Tuca Ferretti and Ricardo Lavolpe. That's yeah. I mean, damn. That's the, that's awesome, man. You you were coached by by some of the best, and I it just went right past me that you were coached by Hugo Sanchez, who we know him as arguably the best Mexican player of all time, one of the best strikers in Real Madrid history. But his coaching career, for whatever reason, he just you know it just didn't seem to click, and he hasn't gotten an opportunity to redeem himself um, yet. And he's 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 on TV now. So um, yeah, that's. That's insane, man. You were coached by some very, very good people. Um, so now let me ask you this. What is tougher to prepare for? A game that you're playing in, a game that you're coaching, or a game that you're going to call on TV? Hmm. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I think all of them are different, but I will say that uh, as a player, it's harder to prepare. Because you have all these um, external situations that you cannot control and uh, that you have to be prepared for. Uh, if it's raining, if it's not raining, if it's too hot, if the grass is tall, if the grass is short, uh, if you don't have hot water. Uh, different situations that you in your head have to prepare, but, but you don't know if they're going to happen or not. So uh, I will say as a player, it's, it's the hardest one because... Uh, yeah, as, as a coach, you analyze uh, your opponent, your rival, and uh, uh, yes, you take in consideration all these other things, but mainly you focus on, on your style, or at least um, that's what I think. You know, As a coach, you have to focus on your strengths, and yes, analyze a little bit your, your opponent and probably make some tweaks, but not to change drastically uh, based on one, what you're going to face. Uh, I don't like that type of coaching. I respect it, but I don't like it. <laughs> And, uh, and as an analyst, you know, you have so much information. And uh, what I try to do, like I told you before, you know, when I'm not working, I try to uh, watch games, watch clips. If I don't know a player, I go and um, you know, using different platforms, uh, I try to see the way he plays, his style, his strengths, weaknesses. So when it's game time, I already know uh, what he can bring to the game, uh, depending on the situation that the game is uh, developing. So it's not too hard because we have a lot of tools already. I don't have to. I don't have to sleep early. I don't have to take care of what I eat. I don't have to uh, prepare as I was uh, preparing uh, when I was a soccer player, right? That you have to sleep certain hours, eat certain time at certain hours, um, hydrate as well. So, yeah, as a player, it's harder. Yeah, it, it sounds a whole like a whole lot harder because, again, it's all those little elements that you cannot control. It, it, must, it must eat at you when you first start and then you probably learn to deal with it um the yeah. the older you get right um so you played as a left back correct 
Uh, most of my career I play as a right back, uh, oh. and and it's a funny story because I was a winger. You know, I was fast. <laughs> I, I I like to have the ball on my feet and go on one v one situations all the time. And Tuca, um, the funny the funny story is that uh, I was playing with the U seven U eighteen team uh, in, with the Pumas Academy, and I wasn't a starter. You know, I I had always. Uh, uh, oh, I always struggled in my career with being the, the smallest one, the, the shortest one. The, I mean, I wasn't too strong. So I wasn't a starter with that team. And the, the first team, uh, which was Tuca's team, needed a, an extra player because they had so many injuries. So my coach in the U18s sent me to train with the first team because I wasn't going to uh, be playing with my team that weekend. So I went, and then Tuka asked me, uh, what position do you play? I need a right back. He's like, well, I'm a right winger. He's like, okay, today you're going to play as a right back. So I play as a right back. I made tons of mistakes, obviously, defensively. But offensively, which was my strength, I went up all the time. So the next day, Tuka uh, asked me to go again uh, and, and train with them, and uh, everything started there. Uh, after the end of the week, he, he said, uh, you know what? I don't want you to go back to your team. I want you to come and train with us for the rest of the season. That was 1995. And uh, after the second week or so, he told me, uh, I know you're a winger, but I believe that if you want to have a shot in, in, a, in a first edition, you should move back to the right back position. And, and that will give you more possibilities to, to play and to, to uh, have a solid career. So, I mean, I was 17, 18. I said, yeah, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Uh, I did, and, uh, and he was right. I mean, uh, and it's funny because... I didn't play my first game as a, I was promoted to the first team as a right back, but I didn't play my first game as a professional player in that position. Another coach put me as a holding midfielder uh, in, in the second half. And uh, so, I mean, I didn't even remember that, you know, it was something that I didn't remember. I was watching the game a couple of days ago, but after that, with all the, uh, I became a student of the game. Then they put me on the left, put me as a holding midfielder, offensive midfielder, right winger, left winger. The only two positions that I never played was uh, number nine or center center forward and center back, and obviously goalkeeper. But I played all, all the other positions. Wow. Wow. Uh, right here, I preach a lot about players being versatile. So you would have been one of my favorites when uh, <laughs> if I was doing this while, while, you, were, while you were playing. You, you played for Pumas. Is it safe to say that you're yes. a Pumas fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Since <laughs> I was four. I mean, okay. I, I uh, grew up uh, enjoying uh, Pumas games. I was playing at the first. It wasn't the academy. It was just uh, the soccer club. From uh, four to 12, 13 that I joined the academy, I was every weekend playing games with my teams and helping other teams when they don't when they didn't they didn't have enough players you know to play then after that we went to the stadium enjoyed the game and then after that we were eating some carne asada outside of the stadium so it was the whole day over there in ciudad universitaria then i went to school uh the pumas or, or unam school and uh, i couldn't get my degree there but uh yeah i mean i'm i'm pumas but since i was four well, wow, yeah, and and you played for the team that you love, which is absolutely incredible. What what was that feeling when you when you made your debut? And, uh, and I'm pretty sure there was a lot of tension, a lot of excitement. How was it? Yeah, it was it was something that I uh, actually don't remember as clear as uh, as I was I was mentioning it before. I, I thought that I played my first game as a right back, and it, it wasn't like that. I played in a holding position. I I made two. Uh, terrible mistakes in my first game. You know, we were losing 1-0, and after those two mistakes, uh, we lost the game 3-0, 3-0. But it was a great experience. Uh, uh, I I always say that in my head, in in the back of my head, I never wanted to be a professional soccer player. I was just enjoying the game. You know, my, my, my dad was a very good soccer player. Uh, he was a Cruz Azul reserve team, but he couldn't play because different circumstances. Uh, he, he wasn't getting paid enough, so uh, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, uh, live his dream as a soccer player, but he never pushed me. You know, he was letting me enjoy the game, uh, and that, that's what I did when I was a kid, just play and have fun. And I continued doing that until I reached the age of 19, almost 20, when they called me to the U-20 national team to play the World Cup. And after that, I realized that I really had a shot to play 
pro to have a career not just to enjoy the game you know so uh after that experience with the national team uh, something clicked in my head and i started to pursue actually um uh, having a solid career not just playing just one year or five or six games and then uh, that was it so uh to be honest with you and, and going back to to your question it wasn't uh, at that moment. It wasn't much to me uh, playing my first game with Pumas. It was Pumas, yes, it was. But in my head, it's like, okay, this is just the beginning. I wanna, I wanna play more. I wanna do more. I wanna be important with with this club. Wow, that's a uh, great mentality to have. That, uh, that's for sure. And it's also kind of funny that you say that you don't actually recall much of of that game, and you had to go back and and see that you weren't playing that position <laughs> that you thought you were playing. Um, yeah, it's 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 really insane, man. It, it, it's crazy how how life works. Because again, you you mentioned a lot of stuff right there, and how this was just a game for you. <laughs> you know, it, it was just a game, and all of a sudden you're professional, playing for the team that you love. You're representing the Mexican national team. Uh, it's it it's it's some story. Um, but here, let me ask you this: out of the teams that that you played in. Which one did you enjoy playing in the most? Let's exclude Pumas from this one because I think it might be a bit too obvious or not. Uh, but mm -hmm. which team did did you have the most fun in? Um, it was different. Uh, I enjoy playing for all of them, but in a different way. Pumas because I was playing with my friends. You know, I knew mm -hmm. those guys since I was 13, 14. So it was, it was like going out on the street and playing with your friends. Uh, inside of the stadium so that was that was great that was a great experience then with santos uh, i won the championship and uh i experienced something different with with players actually uh training in a different way with a goal of winning a championship you know in pumas i was just enjoying the situation but when i moved to santos uh the main goal was to win a championship and i had teammates like Jared Borghetti, Pony Ruiz, I mean, uh, Hector Altamirano, uh, players that represented our, our, our country in a, in a very good way. So when I was, you know, crossing the ball for Jared after the regular training session, he was very demanding. He's like, okay, I need the ball here. I don't need it here because if you want me to score, I need the ball here. So it's like, oh, I'll learn. But I enjoyed it, obviously, with, with the championship. And then uh, in, in Morelia, in Monarcas Morelia, I, I probably enjoy the tactical side of the game because I was surrounded with smart players, which is really hard to find. So without talking, just by reading the game uh, with Fernando Arce, with uh, Hector Castro, with uh, uh, Jorge Almiron, I mean, we, we had amazing players. Just with, uh, you know, the way we were reading the game, he was moving on one side, I was moving on the other side. And we were enjoying playing because it was kind of easy you know, uh, to play uh, the game with them. It was effortless. Uh, actually, we, we finished first um, in the first position that year with Monarcas Morelia, and then we lost in the semifinal. But, uh, but I enjoy it in different ways. Uh, all my different stages with different teams. But if I have to choose one, I will choose Monarcas Morelia. Wow. That's yeah. that's interesting and that's sad because uh, that that team no longer <laughs> exists. And you know what's funny? Sure. Let me mention this to you real quick. My family is actually from Michoacan, and I have a couple okay. family members that are fans of Monarcas Morelia, uh, which is you know I'm, again it's kind of sad, but that's uh, that's awesome. You had fun. It was easy for you for you guys to play because you guys were just so tactically advanced. Um, it's very rare. You're right. It's very rare to find players that are that are so um, so smart. Y bueno, Mariano, ahora te voy a hacer unas preguntas en español, eh, porque yo creo que sería muy injusto que no habláramos en español en esta entrevista. Mencionaste eh, que, que jugaste con la selección mexicana, jugaste en la, en la selección sub-20, también algunas participaciones en, en la selección mayor. Para ti como jugador, ¿qué representó, qué, qué, más bien qué significó representar a la selección mexicana? Eh, todo como jugador activo el sueño más grande que tienes es representar a tu país eh, y, y tal vez eso suena, suena a cliché pero cuando estás fuera de tu país escuchando el himno nacional y vistiendo el jersey que tú traes puesto el de la selección mexicana eh, toma un sentido distinto ¿no? eh, yo tuve la posibilidad de jugar partidos eh, en Estados Unidos con la selección mexicana y cuando ves un Gillette Stadium 
a reventar, ¿no? O sea, de, de tantos eh, seguidores mexicanos, de tantos paisanos que vienen en este país y que no sabes si, si tienen para comer o no tienen para comer, pero hacen el esfuerzo para ir a apoyar a su selección. Eso cambió mi perspectiva, ¿no? Y me hizo sentir muy orgulloso porque de cierta forma tú estando en la cancha eres una extensión de ellos y de toda la gente en México. Entonces, eso era una gran responsabilidad. Eh, pero a la, a la misma vez eh, un gran orgullo no eh, siempre que me puse la camiseta de la selección lo mínimo que yo que yo hacía era entregarme al máximo ¿no? entregarme al máximo más allá de las circunstancias si era turf si era sintético el campo si era si hacía frío si hacía calor eh, yo quería que la gente que iba al estadio eh, por lo menos dijera bueno Mariano se entregó al máximo sí definitivamente es es, es algo increíble Cómo, cómo nosotros, porque me incluyo, cómo, cómo apoyamos a la selección. Aunque les metan siete, aunque no jueguen bien, no importa. Sí. El chiste es que ahí estamos apoyando. Eh, es, es conmovedor hasta cierto, hasta cierto punto. También es, es verdaderamente conmovedor. Eh, siguiendo en, esta, en este tópico de la selección mexicana para ti, para Mariano Trujillo. ¿Quién es el mejor jugador en la historia del fútbol mexicano? Estamos hablando eh, y juntando todo. Selección, club, eh, goles, campeonatos, eh, participaciones en, eh, y rendimiento en el extranjero. Todo, todo para ti. ¿Quién es el mejor jugador en la historia del fútbol azteca? Ah, esa, es, esa es una pregunta difícil, ¿no? Porque hay muchos elementos complicados para poner en la balanza. Eh, pero así de rápido, eh, al vapor diría que Javier Hernández, ¿no? Javier Hernández porque ha conseguido títulos con la selección, porque su carrera en Europa también tuvo títulos, eh, con, ha jugado en los equipos más importantes o en algunos de los más importantes de Europa como Real Madrid, Manchester United, eh, es el líder goleador histórico de la selección nacional. Eh, y lo pongo por encima de los demás y la gente dice, bueno, ¿qué le pasa a Mariano? Pero eh, me parece que él en, en, en la selección ha dado resultado. Por ejemplo, a Hugo Sánchez yo lo considero el mejor delantero de la historia y tal vez el mejor jugador de la historia del fútbol mexicano, pero en selección nunca le fue bien. Uh -huh. no Por este su Mundial, el del Italia 90, fu fuimos castigados y no fuimos. Eh, en el Mundial del 94, bueno, no pudo jugar en el partido importante. Después eh, con Rafa, Rafa Márquez, que le fue muy bien en Europa y con Barcelona, también en los momentos eh, complicados en el, con Selección Nacional, bueno, pues tampoco le fue tan bien. Y el hecho de que Javier Hernández sea el máximo goleador de la Selección Nacional, me parece que le da puntos extras. Después puedes meter eh, en la bolsa jugadores como Claudio Suárez, que es el que más partidos tiene. Eh, que representó a Selección muy bien, que ganó la Confederaciones, Andrés Guardado, que está por ahí detrás con una gran carrera en Europa, Carlos Vela tal vez que es un jugador muy, muy talentoso, pero que a lo mejor no ha terminado de, de convencer por muchas situaciones. Entonces, eh, yo pondría a Javier Hernández por todas estas cosas que te digo. Eh, entiendo que, que esto, esto es muy discutible ¿no? y sería muy difícil ponernos de acuerdo en todos los renglones, ¿no? Por, porque es muy diferente para cada jugador. Tremendo, Javier Hernández. Eh, o sea que cuando llegó a, a Los Ángeles hace unos cuantos meses y dijo que regresó como una leyenda, tú no fuiste de esas personas que se enojó, me imagino. <risa> no, 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 no. Eh, porque mira, eh, justo hace unos días estaba pensando, eh, y no quiero hacer una separación porque hoy estoy de este lado, pero la mayoría de la gente, eh, llámese periodistas o aficionados, que no estuvieron en el terreno de juego, tienden a de meritar mucho lo que se realiza, no solo por Javier Hernández, sino en general, ¿no? O sea, me parece que hoy eh, es muy fácil con las redes sociales el decir, ah, este es muy malo, este es muy bueno, etcétera, lo cual es válido, o sea, no, no me estoy quejando de que no se haga, pero me parece que, que cuando de cierta forma tienes la experiencia ¿no? de, de haber estado ahí, dices, esto que está haciendo él es muy difícil. ¿No? Y esto significa en lo, que, en lo que tú te dediques. Si tú eres un eh, trabajador de la construcción y yo llego y critico una casa, seguramente el, jor, el, el, perdón, el trabajador de la construcción va a decir, bueno, a ver, ponte tú y clava las maderas y pone el plywood y, y haz todo esto. Seguramente este, no me va a quedar igual. ¿no? Yo creo que debemos de otorgar un poco de respeto a la gente que tiene experiencia. Y basado en eso, eh, creo que lo que ha hecho Javier Hernández sí lo pone en un lugar de leyenda. ¿No? A gente le puede gustar o no, pero ya insisto, el simplemente ser el máximo anotador de la selección mexicana eh, y después de haber hecho lo que hizo en Europa, eh, me parece que, que sí, que es una leyenda del fútbol mexicano, del fútbol mexicano. ¿no? 
Sí, de eso completamente de acuerdo. Leyenda del fútbol mexicano, sin duda, sin duda. Y bueno, a, aunque a mucha gente sí le haya molestado, definitivamente no mintió. Porque representó muy claro. bien a, a México allá en el extranjero. Ahora, una, una pregunta un, un poco más light. Porque tú usas una frase muy seguido en tus redes sociales. <risa> sin llorar. Sí, sí. Me encanta la frase. Sí, porque sí. aplica para todo. Eh, en inglés... Uh, ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo es la, la traducción en, en, en inglés? ¿Suck it up? Suck it up, sí, sí. He estado, digo, he estado ahí buscando algunas eh, eh, traducciones, pero en los juegos de mis hijos, este, muchos papás, cuando había una, una jugada fuerte o cuando el árbitro no marcaba algo, bueno, gritaban esta frase de suck it up, ¿no? Entonces dije, bueno, va de la mano con sin llorar. Suck it up es lo que de repente cuando me toca hacer partidos en inglés utilizo en lugar del sin llorar. <risa> ¿Y de dónde nace esa frase, sin llorar? Porque... Te, tiene muy, mucho de mexicano es, esa frase. Sí, Una mamá sí, mexicana seguramente sí. te dice eso, pero ¿de dónde nace? Mira, es, es, tiene un trasfondo distinto, ¿no? Porque el sin llorar para mí significa no solamente... Pues nosotros como mexicanos, cuando decimos, cuando decimos sin llorar, es en, en tono de, de mofa, de burla, mm. ¿no? De, ya, no estés llorando, dale. Pero para mí eso tiene un símbolo distinto, o un significado, mejor dicho, distinto, porque el sin llorar significa el ser positivo, ¿no? el ser positivo. Yo lo escuché por primera vez de un entrenador de manera coloquial, jovial, de decir, ya, ya, sin llorar. En, una, en un entrenamiento donde estaba marcando mal a propósito este, para que los jugadores no se quejaran. Eh, entonces yo lo adopté en, en mi vida, el decir, bueno, hoy no jugué, ok, sin llorar. What, what's next? ¿Qué sigue? Este, ok, el entrenador no me puso, ok, sin llorar. No te quedes en el momento estancado, llorando y quejándote cuando tienes la posibilidad de reaccionar de manera positiva ante cualquier situación en la vida, ¿no? Hay situaciones difíciles, complicadas, en el trabajo, con la familia, pero siempre tenemos la posibilidad como individuos de reaccionar de manera positiva. Entonces, algo que, que fuera, que capturara mi atención y que yo recordara rápido eh, fue esta frase, fue el sin llorar, ¿no? Entonces, estaba yo en la cancha, me pateaban y el árbitro no marcaba, en mi cabeza de inmediato era, ok, ok, ya, este, déjalo atrás sin llorar, ¿qué, qué sigue? Y bueno, le he dado adoptado en, en lo que es mi vida diaria, ¿no? En lo que es mi relación con, con mis compañeros de trabajo, con este, mi familia. Es decir, que okay, ya eh, no, 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 no te quejes, este, movamos, movámonos para adelante, ¿no? Seamos positivos. Qué bien, qué bien que, que tenga un significado tan, tan positivo para, para ti, para la gente en tu vida. Um, all right, let's go back to English now and finish this off really quick. I know that there's, uh, there's got to be a, a, a few kids watching this, uh, maybe some parents watching watching this and they would like to know what what is one thing mariano trujillo would tell them in order to find success as a professional soccer player mm -hmm. uh, if i have to choose only one i will tell him to enjoy the game you know i've been i've been doing a couple of interviews lately Uh, with former teammates, uh, with players that I play against, and the common denominator with all of them is that they didn't enjoy it mm -hmm. uh, the way they should. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me as well. Uh, until I was 13, 14, and, and probably a little bit older, I enjoyed the game, you know, and I didn't have in my head that pressure of I have to deliver, I have to perform. That was only a consequence of me enjoying the game and, and having a, a work ethic. Um, Uh, of uh, giving the 100% all the time, regardless of the different exercise or drill or situation that we were doing in, during, during the training sessions. I just wanted to be the best because that, uh, that's what I was taught in my, in my house. I wanted to train well, but in my head, I uh, didn't have any pressure of being a professional soccer player. So it's really hard to separate those, those uh, lanes of those two channels uh, in, in um, you know, achieving your dream of becoming a professional soccer player. But if you lose that joy, then uh, it is not going to work. It's not going to work because there are so many aspects that you cannot control that will uh, criticize you and that will punish you if you don't do it well. That if you don't have the joy, which is what the only thing that keeps you focused then you're going to quit. You're going to quit really, really fast, either uh, at the early age or when you are 20, 21, 20, whatever age you are. You know, if you don't have that um, enthusiasm to go on the field and, and have fun, then uh, all the other external uh, elements uh, will, get, will get in your head and you will quit. 
Wise words from a wise man. Thank you so much, Mariano Trujillo, you. for for your time. Uh, for those that aren't following you, uh, let them know where they can follow you on social media. Uh, anything that you're working on, any projects, go ahead, man. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, we are in, uh, at uh, Mariano T19. I was going to say another one, but that's the old, that was the old one. I'm sorry. <laughs> at Mariano T19 on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Mariano Trujillo on Facebook, and uh, we also have this project of uh, Sin Llorar, el podcast, uh, alongside Rodolfo Landeros, el emperador Claudio Suarez, John Laguna. Uh, we have this podcast, and now we have the YouTube channel when, uh, where, where we do interviews like, like this one with former teammates, with former uh, national team players, coaches, uh, and we touch uh, a different aspect of the game, uh, not just the the uh, you know, the lights and, and, and the beauty of the game, but also the, the dark side of the game and the personal aspect of the game as well uh, and, and athletes and coaches. So if you guys want to follow, you're more than welcome. Uh, Sin Llorar el Podcast, YouTube, uh, Spotify, and iTunes, and add Mariano T19 uh, in Twitter, Instagram, and, uh, and Facebook as well. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Mariano, once again, thank you so much. Todo un crack, eh? Muchas gracias. Um, and yeah, man, if... Uh, if if I ever want to do this again, <laughs> I'm going to hit you up. I'm going to hit you up. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Mariano. There he was, ladies and gentlemen, Mariano Trujillo. What a man. Uh, just very, very knowledgeable, very intelligent. You can catch him on Fox Deportes calling the games of the Bundesliga every Saturday morning. Um, and real quick, uh, before I finish, before we finish this this episode, I want to announce something to you all. Um of course, starting a couple days ago, if you follow me on my Instagram and any other social media, you know that I launched a new project called Football de Baul, which roughly translates to soccer from the vault. And the whole purpose of this project, of this Instagram page and this, and this social media page is to remember the, the beautiful things of the beautiful game. There are so many different memories that that I have from the game. So many different goals. So many goals. So many different players. Um, all of that stuff. All of that jazz. It's all going to be up on Football de Baul. It is in Spanish. So if you're not a Spanish speaker, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a translation feature in, on Instagram. Just click translate and you can see what I type. So yeah, I would really, really, really appreciate if... Only if you're interested. I'm, I'm not forcing anyone to do this, of course, because what is this, you know? Um, if you're in, if you're interested and you want to see a different side of me, the historian side of me, come out. Um, you can go ahead and follow that at Football de Baul. I'll leave that link in the description um, of this video. Go ahead and follow that page. Uh, it's it, it's like my baby. VMFC is where I get to talk about the current stuff. Football de Baul is where I get to reminisce on the beautiful things that happen in the beautiful game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that'll do it. Thank you all so much for sticking around. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. Here's a thumbs up for you because you're probably going to give me a thumbs up, right? Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I, I really appreciate the support. And uh, this was a pretty big milestone, VMFC. We got, we, we got a hot shot over here um that in uh, in an interview so that that was pretty cool and once again shout out to mariano trujillo i really appreciate the time he's just an excellent excellent dude uh very easily did i uh, we we made this happen just a very humble down-to-earth person i i told him before we started recording that he, you know he's he, he just he has it right up here so shout out to him um and it's an open forum if he wants to come back he can definitely do this. Um, and as for me, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Alex Perez FC. Um, again, follow my my new page at Football de Baul. It's going to come up right here on the screen and in the description. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Veterans Minimum. If you're watching this, you're on YouTube. You might as well just subscribe, right? Just, just hit the subscribe. Make our days a little bit happier, right? Um, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. And uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash Veterans Minimum. Pledge some money to us, and it's going to go all to a good cause. I want to buy the new PlayStation 5. Um, I, I consider that a good cause. So if you guys donate, I will get a PlayStation 5 whenever it comes out. I am just kidding. 
<laughs> that that's not gonna happen all right goes right back to the show all right ladies and gentlemen thank you so much take care goodbye